Hi, welcome to Chris to Chris's Chick Chats. Today, I am so honored to have Susie Ronson here with me. Um, just to give you a quick background, number one, I met Susie on the Bob Dylan Rolling Thunder Tour in the 70s, and she at that time was married to my favorite guitarist, Mick Ronson, who I had a terrible crush on, but little did I know he had Susie. You are actually the one who designed the very famous Bowie haircut. The initial cut was a copy from a model in a magazine, but it wasn't the same haircut that he ended up with. That model had a short little spiky frew right in the front. Very quickly evolved into my own haircut. Yes, I would say definitely. I designed that little ziggy do. You were, we were, just, we were just talking about this before we started recording that Susie was actually one of the first women on tour, working women on tour. Yeah. And um, that puts us in a, in kind of a special category because back in those days, it was all men. Part of the attraction. <laughs> I was just men. I know. Well, um, well, it was the music really, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> it was, had nothing to do with the men. It was just the music. So just tell us a little bit about your your background and what you did and how you got into it. And then I want to also talk about your book, which is coming okay. out, which I have ordered. I was a little hairdresser from Beckenham who always had dreams of leaving the normal suburban life behind me and doing something wild and wonderful. And I tried. When I was 17, I went to live in Rome for a year. Didn't really, nothing really changed. I came back. Then I went to um, America, Pennsylvania, to stay with my cousin for another six months or so. When I was 20, 21, nothing really changed. I came back to Beckham. And then I went back to work in the hairdressing salon that I'd always been working in, which is where I met Mrs. Jones, David Bowie's mother. From here, I was introduced to Angie Bowie. Now, that was a... That was a cool, crazy girl. Someone, the likes I'd never met before. And I was instantly like, oh my God, who is this person? And she, I did her hair and I put bright stripes down the side of her hair, which in those days just wasn't really, no one did that. But I used to use this cut, light color rinse on the old girls at the salon, like they had the gray hair. So you'd add a few purple drops and make it a slight silvery look. They were brilliant. Those colors were fierce. So I did three stripes in neat color down the side of her head. Well, she loved it. Obviously, David must have loved it too, because eventually I was invited up to the house and I met her and I met David. And he showed me the photograph in this magazine of this girl model with this short red spiky hair. I said, can you do that? <laughs> well, as I'm saying yes, I'm thinking to myself, that's a girl's hairstyle. And how was, how was I going to actually do it? But... The first time I cut it, I mean, it didn't work. He looked like a schoolboy. It was just awful. He didn't look too happy, but I said to him, David, you know, the second we get colour in your hair, the texture will change and it will stand up. Those days, we didn't have fixer tips like we have now. We didn't have anything that was going to help me make it stand up. But there was an anti-dandruff treatment I used to use on the old girls at the salon. Side effect, it set hair like stone. So I used this anti-dandruff treatment and it worked. Luck, intuition and luck. And uh, and Ziggy Stardust is born. When he first saw himself in the mirror, shaking his head and just jumping about. I mean, he looked incredible. He did. Oh, it was wonderful. In fact, I loved it so much that somewhere along the line, I put henna in my hair. Well, Patty put henna in my hair, Patty Boyd. I cut it really short. It was my David Bowie period, it was called. <laughs> did henna go purplish or did it go really red? Oh, did I don't know. It was pretty red. It was pretty red. Not, yeah, it was pretty red. It wasn't, it, it was not purple. Trust me. I even have a photo somewhere of it. So then you went on tour with him. Is that right? Well, I, I, no, well, I didn't at first. I mean, it wasn't in the back of my mind. I thought to myself, they're going to have to hire me because where's he going to go for a touch up? Where's he going to go to get a little trim? Newcastle? Probably not. But at that point, David wasn't famous. I mean, he was playing folk music at the Three Tongues. He had just... I think he'd been with Mick Ronson for a while. I mean, Mick was the one that really changed him. Moon Aid Daydream, a folk song before Mick got hold of it. Mick completely changed him. But he also had a manager, Tony DeFries, and yeah. he changed a lot of stuff as well. So it was Angie, 
Mick and Tony. And I was like a little bit of the icing on the cake, I think. But I they soon started, you know, really getting it really started taking off. And that's when they asked me to join them full time. Got my got my dream came true. All my friends said I was crazy. I was never going to get a job with them. The girls didn't go on the road. But uh, I did manage to do that. Girls didn't go on the road. <laughs> Not at that time. Well, they, I mean, wives would come and visit, girlfriends would visit, groupies were there all the time, but there wasn't anybody actually on the bus instead of waving at it. You know, I swear I wanted to be on the bus, not waving at it. Absolutely. Well, well done, you. That was Thank great. You. Well, well done. You did the same thing as I did in a different way and earlier. It, it wasn't easy, was it? It was not an easy life. No, and it wasn't had... easy, but... You either love the road or you hate it, don't you? I loved it. I loved it. I yeah. was just on tour. I was just on tour. I just went on a 10-day tour with a band called Lust for Life. I saw that. And it was, I mean, it, when you're 22, you bounce out of bed every morning and jump on the bus. I didn't quite do that. <laughs> but it was a lot of fun doing it again. I have to say it was a lot of fun doing it. You know, I went back on the road with Linda Ronstadt in about 2004 or something. Yeah. It wore me out. I thought, how did Yes, it's effort? exhausting, isn't it? it? Yes, it's very exhausting. If you sit on that bus for four hours, you're like, oh, because I was performing this time. I tell my story, do my little 10 minute story on stage before the band came on. But the waiting around, holy moly, you have the waiting for the sound check, the waiting for this. It's a lot of waiting around on the road I found yeah. this time. For me, the show was my recess period. It was like, yes, I suppose it was. Time, and then when they were on stage, I was free. And that was it until they came yeah. on stage and then I was back on again. So it was yeah. hard work. Well, when did you and Mick get together, Mick Ronson? Well, after David broke up the band at the um, at Hammersmith Odeon, we did um, an album after that, Pin Ups. And there was something a little bit different between me and Mick because the rest of the band got fired, the poor things. You know, it was just the worst thing in the world. And I do go into that, how awful I thought that was. But Mick and I survived the cut. After we did Pin Ups, we all went on holiday to a villa just outside of Rome. And it was David and Angie and some of David and Angie's friends and me and Mick. I got myself there because I said I can speak Italian, which was true, I could, and I would help. But things changed between me and Mick when I was there. You know, he kind of held my eyes and I'd always fancied Mick. I mean, I always thought, you know, what a gorgeous bloke, but that wasn't what I wanted. And it didn't seem that was what he wanted either. But there was never any interaction of that nature while he was on the road with David. I remember he invited me to that Cafe Royal party after the breakup of the spiders. But I was so upset that no one had told Trevor and Woody, I couldn't believe no one had told them mm -hmm. that I got drunk in the, with the roadies instead, so I never went to that party. <laughs> but when we did get together, it was in Italy, in Rome. It was so romantic, yeah. Oh, that is very romantic. <laughs> well, it, was, it was lovely. My darling Mick, what a lovely man oh, he is. What a lovely man, honestly. Yeah. I I met him in L.A., God, I think it was when, were they uh, associated with Trident Studios at one time? I oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And there was an American guy that I knew who was sort of managing them along with um, the Sheffields. And he asked me to to um, to meet Mick and say hi and everything. And I thought, oh, what a, he was so sweet. And I yeah. had such a crush on him, but he didn't he didn't return it. So I went, oh, well. And then I met you on the Rolling Thunder Tour. I went, OK, I get it. I don't know if you were with him. I was so, the Rolling Thunder Tour. It was a funny thing, that Rolling Thunder Tour, because we'd always been together. And when that first that tour first came up, he said I couldn't go. That girls weren't, weren't on the road. And I accepted it because I know they were on the road with David and I, and I wasn't working on that tour. But when I went, the Boston was the first time I joined you guys. It was my birthday. And there's Jenny, and there's Rhonda, and there's all these other women, Aviva, Lola. Like, <laughs> maybe they've just come up for the gig, hopefully. And was Jenny's going, well, where have you been? You've all been having such fun. <laughs> And I was shocked because I had he hadn't invited me. I think he wanted to experience it, the whole songwriting 
niche for himself by himself. And I kind of get it, but I was very upset that I didn't get to go. I got to go on the second one. It was, but the uh, first one I understand was the one. Well, the second one, yeah, it was. It wasn't quite the same. The first one was the one, but I can see that because there was a lot of, there were a lot of musicians that were not all associated with each other. They didn't. I don't even yeah. know if they all knew each other. So I can. They see didn't. I mean, Mick said Bob never even spoke to him ever the entire time of that tour. They never spoke, which I thought was amazing. Who know? Is that true? Bob never spoke to him. Never spoke to him. He said he, he never said a word. Didn't say no to me. That I mean, I, I I see in some of the films where Bob kind of looks at him a bit in surprise because Mick, when well, Mick caught up, you know, because he hadn't had Bob Dylan songs before. But when he finally started stretching out in some of the solos, I particularly remember Madison Square Garden. Mick stepped out, and a spider was on stage. I mean, he twirled. He did all his moves. And I could see oh. Bob looking like, what the fuck is this? You know, I mean, it was like a <laughs> shocking, I think. I think Rob Stoner was like, oh, he was playing the bass. Like, no one could quite believe what Mick was doing. And he was incredible. He was incredible that night. I, I actually kind of remember that because it was it's like, oh, wow. Yeah. No, it's he's performing. I mean, he didn't really perform no. on, on those tours because that he wasn't called to perform. But if you ever saw him with David Bowie, my God, what a showman. He was incredible. I, I did. I went to several con more than a oh, couple did you? of shows. Yeah. And you know what I mean. In fact, we maybe in fact you must have been there. Do you remember a night in Los Angeles after the Palladium and afterwards we went to a restaurant, which name has escaped me right now, um, on Santa Monica Boulevard. And I went with Ringo and Maureen. Do you remember coming? I don't think I went. I wasn't always included in those after show things. Are you sure that was the Ziggy tour? Because we played Santa Monica Civic Center. Well, no, that this was not the Ziggy tour. It was um That wasn't there then. Probably it was Ziggy around tour, 70, I was no longer working with David. I'm thinking around 73 or 71. 73 it was over. And like the last time we played in LA, it was Santa Monica Civic Center for two nights. Well, it's anyway, great. I thought you were maybe at that dinner. It was, um, you would have remembered because. I would have remembered because I would have remembered we did Ringo. I used exactly. to have such a crush on all the Beatles. You know, at the beginning <laughs> of my book, I, I was at a Beatles. I think it was, I say I was 14, but the reality is I was 13 at that concert. <laughs> screaming my head off. And it was, it was a very liberating, life-changing moment for me, that concert. Which concert are you talking about? The what Croydon, nineteen sixty four. Oh God, no! The kidding. Beatles. The Beatles. I mean, for some reason, they played in our area twice. I went to see them twice. It was once in the April, which is the one in the book, and then I went again in the September. And I went with a boy I really didn't like, but he got tickets to the Beatles, and I was like, "I like you," kind of a thing. Oh. I was such an awful person, but I loved seeing them. Oh, they were such a great band. Well, at least you could see them. I went to Dodger Stadium and you couldn't really see them. They were like little stick figures down there. Yeah, this, this was only 200 seats in Airport Hall. Oh, God, how lucky oh. are you? I sat right behind the drums. I mean, I could almost touch them. That's Not amazing. that you could hear them. No one could hear them. Everyone screamed for the entire 45 minutes set. Wow. It was crazy. You've written a book and I am, yeah. when's it? I, I ordered it, but I think it's still on. It hasn't been released. It yet. hasn't come out yet. It's April the 4th it's come out. Ooh, I'm excited. And I it's, just like, yeah. can I just read something that's written about it? A luminescent memoir from the stylist who created David's iconic Ziggy Stardust look, painting a dazzling picture of Bowie and the wild world of his Andrage during this pivotal moment in pop history. I want to read this. I'm dying to read this. I'm, I'm, being, I'm so lucky. I'm getting such nice comments about this book and such nice reviews that I'm like, my heart stands still. I, I mean, I, I wrote the book. I had no clue that I, I, mean, I, got the, I got the front cover of the Sunday Times in England. Can you imagine? The Guardian gave me Book of the Week. So that for me, it's been a real shock, to be honest. I mean, I thought it was sell something because it's David Bowie. But it's going over so well. I'm I'm delighted. I can't believe it, but I'm really thrilled. Yes. Well, I am so happy for you because we need Thank you, this. Chris. This is our history. We are the historians of what of the music that we grew up with. And to have you have your story out and your reviews 
I'm dying to read it. I am so excited. Thank you. So what are you planning on doing? Are you going to go on a little book tour? Are you coming to the... Well, I've done my little book tour. I did a book tour with a band called Lust for Life. Yeah. I, I, did, I did my 10-minute story. I'm doing a launch in London in a few days, March 26th. It should be fun. It should be a nice launch. And then I'm doing one in New York in April 9th, I think it is. The 6th of the, yeah, yeah, 9th, April 9th in New York at P&T Knitwear. And everyone should come down to that one as well. I think I'm doing things at the Tunbridge Book Festival, but I'm hoping to do, I'm doing Fox News, I think. But I'm doing Fox News. There's a couple of things that have been asked, but I don't, not much in America at the moment. I'm hoping that if this kind of drifts across the Atlantic, I might get some more invitations. Well, I would think so. Once it comes out and people are reading it, we'll try, we'll do everything we can to help. I, I live in New York. I don't live in, I live in New York. And um, bop around to L.A. I mean, I do move around the States quite a bit, so I'm quite capable of doing things. Well, you're going to have to come see me in Tucson. <laughs> I'd love to come to Tucson. I'll get you into a, I'll do a book thing for that's you. That's where my husband's hair broke off. We were in Arizona. It's a funny story. David wasn't flying. He wouldn't fly. He would just drive. So we ended up waiting for him in Phoenix, Arizona. And we were at one of those motels that has got a pool and a little restaurant and not much else. But, of course, being English, hot weather, by a pool, what could be fine? And no one gave a damn. We were just so thrilled to be lying out in the suburb. <laughs> Mick loved to lie in the sun. And he kept going in the pool. Well, the pool was very heavily chlorinated. And his hair was pretty well bleached. So it started going green, like a mint green colour. And then it started breaking up. Because he'd always resisted having those ziggy little spikes. He wouldn't do it. You know, he had this smooth crown. And then his hair broke off. If you look at the early photographs, he had more of this quaff look. But after Phoenix, Arizona, this chlorine chewed <laughs> off his hair. And he ended up with spikes, like it or not. Oh, he did. God. Uh, he, li <laughs> he liked it then after that. Well, I I'm, I'm, I am a good hairdresser, and I did make him look absolutely, not that it was hard, because he's a wonderful looking man, but I made him look incredible. Yeah, I did. Mick got ill. Did he have cancer? Is that what happened? He had cancer. He was only 46 when he died. That, I, I was shocked. The worst, the absolute worst loss of my life. The worst time of my life, just the worst everything of my life with losing Mick. It was really unfair. You know, he had so much more to give Mick musically, what he could have done, what he was doing, I mean, what he could have done if he had, I wish it had just given him a little lesson, you know, slow down, you know, don't drink so much, don't smoke so much, don't do all these things that all these bloody rock stars do. And because it's so funny, Chris, because we had some ups and downs in our marriages, I think most rock and roll marriages do. But once I was with him and that happened, I wasn't doing anything, hardly drinking, no, no, doing it, neither was he. We never got along better. You know, it was just the clarity of no, you know, no haze between you. And we got along like we used to do. And it was, Mixella, I'm really well, except I've got cancer. You know, <laughs> and it was, the rest of him was responding beautifully to all this stuff, except for this cancer. Oh, yeah. honey, I'm so sorry. I mean, that was a real loss and for everybody. It was a loss for... You know, people never really knew. I don't think a lot of people don't realize what don't. an important musician and what an incredibly talented musician Mick Ronson was. In my book, I definitely point that out many times. Oh, I was yay. Down. So, yes, I'm able to do that. I mean, the person that suffered the most was his daughter. My lovely Lisa was only 15 when Mick died. He was a great dad. You know, when he was around, he was a great dad, and he would have been a great dad. And I'm really sorry that she doesn't have that in her life. I am. I think it really affected her. Well, I, did she enjoy? Did she enjoy reading your book? I'm not sure she read the whole thing. To be absolutely honest, you know, I think she's she's not much of a reader. I don't know. Mick wasn't much of a reader. I'm an. I'm a, I love to read. I mean, I just I just gobble things up, but. She's not really like that. I think she's managed to get through it now. But um, I think she, yeah, no, she thinks she's quite surprised, I think, that it's a, it's a good book. She, Mum, it's a really good book. It's really oh. entertaining. 
really easy to read. And I'm like, well, thanks, Lisa. I mean, it's thank you. Will you come back again? I'm thinking. Yes, I'd love to come back again. It's so nice to see you. Oh, it's I've so always seen you so fondly. You were always so nice to me on the Rolling Thunder Review. You oh. were always so You were not hard to be nice to, my dear. <laughs> not at all. And thanks for inviting me on your show. I truly appreciate it. Thank you. I'm so happy that you were able to be here, even though you're on a different continent right now. I must point that out. So, but, but, but let's keep in touch. I am going to thank Susie so much and everybody else. Please uh, look, please, once you see this, I want you to share it. I want you to subscribe. Please share it with as many people as you can. Get us all out there. We women will appreciate it, wouldn't we? Thank you. Yeah. So Thank you so much, Chris.